All right. So welcome everyone to receiving your, your UT Dallas I-20. I'm Lark. Hi, I'm Sarah. And we are going to kind of walk you through the step-by-step -step process on how to receive your I-20 in order to enter the country and get started studying at UT Dallas. Mm -hmm. I'll just mention that we're both um, immigration advisors here mm -hmm. at um, UT Dallas, and so this is kind of one of our main things that we do, right, Lark, is mm -hmm. just is reviewing documents and issuing the I-20, and then once you're here on campus, we keep that I-20 up to date for you. Yes, and we are also here that if you have any questions regarding your immigration, making sure that you maintain your status, and uh, follow all the rules of your status, mm -hmm. and you have questions about that, that's also what we're here for. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, just some general information about the webinar. So if you have any issues with the connectivity during the webinar, um, just exit and restart the Collaborate program and hopefully that should fix the issue. Uh, we also record all the webinars um, and so you can view those at the URL that you can see in the slide right there. Uh, another thing to note is that while you can see and hear us, we okay. cannot see and hear you. Uh, so if you have any questions once the, the webinar gets started, you're welcome to type those into the chat box. However, we will not be answering any questions until the end of the presentation. Mm -hmm. So our general agenda for this presentation is that we're going to go over all the steps for getting your I-20. We'll have a Q&A at the end if you have any questions, uh, and then we will wrap up. That's right. All right, so we'll just kind of get started on the actual process of applying for your UTD I-20. So in order to get your I-20, there are several things that you'll need, some information that you'll need, and some documentation. So one of the things that you already have is your address. And we actually do need to know your foreign address. Sometimes students are confused about why we need to know that address, because once you get to the US, you'll also give us your US address. Mm -hmm. But that foreign address is really important and it's part of your visa application process. So make sure that that's correct. It does need to be a physical address and not a PO box. Mm -hmm. So just give us the physical address. We're not gonna actually mail anything to that address. It's just for record's sake. Then you also need to give us the appropriate financial documents. We do have to see one year of living expenses and tuition. So that's an academic year. If you're joining us in the spring, that will be for spring plus fall, or it could be fall plus spring if you're coming in in August. So that is an estimated cost of expenses. This is just looking at your tuition estimate uh, estimation and then a, just a general cost of what it does take to live and um, get about you know, transportation, health insurance, books, those kinds of expenses. Mm -hmm. It's not actually what you pay to UT Dallas. So that money actually doesn't literally come, but it's what you need to just have to encounter expenses throughout your academic year. Right, and we, we do not evaluate the costs on a student-by-student -student basis. Mm -hmm. um, the university provides us with those estimate expenses, and then for various policy reasons, those are the numbers that we have to follow. Uh, so just so that you're aware, um, the, the amount of hours that you're taking or the other uh, specific types of... Mm -hmm. um, like if you have lots of roommates, so you're sharing. Yes, those, right? exactly. We, we don't look into that. Yeah, we, we, can't, we can't adjust the numbers <laughs> any more than what is on the chart that's on our website. Right, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> Sometimes we do get those questions. Yes. So this is a very just general estimate. Mm -hmm. And then your costs will vary. Then um, we also need to see what's called the financial affidavit. This is um, something that is, was created by UT Dallas. So it's not a government form, mm -hmm. but it's just sort of a, a way for us to know who is helping you with your funding. So if that's you, you indicate that and sign it. If it's sponsors, then they also sign the affidavit. And this is just to show that they know that they're sponsoring you, right? Like you can't just write in your, your auntie's name and <laughs> hope that she's gonna give you money. She needs to agree to that as well. Mm -hmm. And then of course, the copy of your passport, because we need to make sure we have your legal name and just that documentation on file. So I do think we're gonna go into detail a little bit more on each of these mm -hmm. as we go. So, um, 
Once you compile all these documents, you do submit them through iComet. After you get admitted, this is when the I-20 process starts. Mm -hmm. So make sure you go through the whole admission process. You will get your, your academics reviewed, your transcripts. All of that is handled through the admission office. Mm -hmm. not our office actually and make sure that when you do get admitted that you accept your admission through your galaxy profile because that step needs to be completed in order for us to actually issue the i-20 and you at that point will get access to iComet and that lets you submit documents to us in a secured way um, and keeps everything together in your immigration file so send it through iComet and after that, we will review your documents and hopefully get you that I-20. You'll know that your I-20 has been issued when you get an email from us, and that will have instructions on the next steps, like how to get your I-20 and how to maintain your status and get your visa and things like that. Mm -hmm. Questions can be sent to ISSO Perspective, so feel free to ask those questions throughout the process if you aren't sure what kind of documents are accepted or um, want to know what's going on with your I-20. So let's get more information on these estimated expenses, Lark. Yes. Um, so as we mentioned before, these are just the general estimated numbers that are provided by the university of what they expect that you will roughly pay. Again, this is not exactly what you will pay, but these are the numbers that need to be used in order to issue your I-20 um, and to fill out that financial information for your visa interview. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can find these figures on our website. There is a page that is just called estimated expenses for I-20. Uh, you can follow that URL that is on the slide, or I personally just like using the search bar on the UTD website. It works pretty well. It works so well. It, <laughs> it's better than just actually typing in the URL. Right. Yeah. So if you, if you just search estimated expenses, it'll, it'll be the first thing that pops up. Um, so the general division of what determines the number that we use to evaluate your particular financial documents is, first of all, whether you are an undergraduate or a graduate. So that has two different sets of numbers. And then within those categories, whether or not you um, are paying resident tuition or non-resident tuition. And uh, I believe it's in a, a slide later on, but just as a note, um, if you have received a UT Dallas scholarship for $1,000 or more, you do get qualified for the uh, resident tuition estimated expenses. Mm -hmm. And just to clarify, because these terms might be new for you, a resident is um, typically someone who lives in Texas, right? Mm -hmm. So there are different state laws that do reduce the cost of tuition for people that are from Texas. Mm -hmm. So that figure that amount of tuition is going to be lower. Now sometimes international students can be assessed as a resident mm -hmm. even though you're not from Texas and so as Lark mentioned if you get a UTD scholarship and there might be other situations where you could tap into a resident rate then um, that tuition is reduced and the amount of money that you need to show us is reduced as well. Yes and usually I believe it's the registrar's office that you would talk to mm -hmm. about what would qualify you for the res actual resident tuition when it comes to paying your actual right. education. Right and we don't make that <laughs> decision mm -hmm. unfortunately okay so as we mentioned before one of the required documents for showing your funds is the UT Dallas financial affidavit so we're going to start kind of looking at some details of this form so these the required fields of this form is first of all your reason for submitting so as initial students that is entering the U.S. for the first time, that is the particular uh, box that you would check in that first section. Then you, as the student, will sign and date the second section of this form. Then if you have any sponsors that are willing to help you pay for your expenses, their names, signatures, and the date needs to be in the sponsor section of this form. Uh, and last, there is also a section that is optional that your bank can fill out uh, to show the current funds that are in your bank accounts at, at this time. Mm -hmm. Right, and that is optional. So if your bank doesn't want to fill that out, you would do 
um, supplemental documentation, mm -hmm. which would be like a bank statement. So a bank statement does come from your bank, as you mentioned. Um, it needs to meet all of these criteria. So hopefully if you go into your bank account and talk to a manager at the bank, they'll be able to issue a bank statement. I'd say that these are rather common, even if you yourself have never asked for them before. And then you can tell them what the criteria is. It does need to be in English, although it can be in multiple languages as long as English is also clearly on the official statement. Mm -hmm. It needs to be on bank letterhead. So this isn't just a piece of paper that someone's writing up your information on or even typing it up. It needs to be an official bank documentation. It needs to clearly have the account holder's name using the English alphabet. Again, it could use characters as long as it also has the English alphabet on there as well because what we're gonna do is match the name of the account holder to the person that signed your financial affidavit. Mm -hmm. We also need to see the type of account. And I'd say this is the one that's a little bit trickier than the other information on here. We need to see, is this a savings account? Is this a, a checking account? Is it, has there been deposits made? If it's something else like an investment or um, you know just different type of money, we just have to know because some of them can be counted for your tuition and some of them cannot. And that all, all of that information about what type of money can and can't be accepted is on our website. So check that out if you're not sure. But it just needs to be listed on the account documentation so that we can provide that assessment. We also need to see the balance of the account. So how much money um, is in the account. Then the date of issuance. For your bank statements, the date of issuance needs to be within the year. So if it's pretty fresh, we'll accept it. If it's more than one year old, then you know a lot can change in a year. So go ahead and provide us an updated version of that. And also when it comes to uh, bank statements, if you have online services with your bank that allows you to print online statements, mm -hmm. that is perfectly fine as long as it has all of this information included. That's right. So you, even though we like to see a signature, if it's a bank statement that's been printed online, it doesn't have to have that signature. The thing that we look for is the letterhead, mm -hmm. the bank letterhead. Okay, so sometimes we don't have a huge bank account that's just ready to give money, yep. so um, a loan is perfectly acceptable as well. Yes. So what type of loan will we accept? Basically, you need to remember the word sanctioned. It needs to be a sanctioned loan. Sanctioned can also mean in principle or um, on our website, there are a couple other words that different types of loans might use, but really you're looking for something that's already been approved. Mm -hmm. We don't accept conditional loans. So again, the statement needs to be in English, needs to be on letterhead, it has the date of issuance and the principal amount of the loan. So similar to the bank statement, but this is an important point. It needs to have the borrower and any co-borrowers clearly mentioned. And the co-borrowers also need to sign that affidavit. Mm -hmm. So if it's, if it's in your name, that's fine. We can get your signature. But if it's in your name and a parent has also uh, been a guarantor on the, or guarantor on the loan, then they also need to sign the affidavit. Mm -hmm. but get students delayed just a little bit when they forget that. Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> okay, so another uh, type of funding that we will accept are salary statements. Um, however, there are some limitations uh, when it comes to the amounts that we can accept from salary statements. Uh, so it has a lot of similar requirements as to the bank statements and the loan letters. So it needs to be in English, it needs to have the company letterhead, uh, and the sponsor's name must be visible in English characters on the statement. Um, so the salary statement must show the amount of money that your sponsor makes per year. It needs to be the annual salary, not uh, by month or any alternative. Um, so we will accept up to one third of the annual base salary to include in the estimated expenses for your I-20. Uh, so what that means is if um, 
your sponsor gets any other kinds of compensation, any bonuses or anything like that, those numbers will not be included. We will only take a third of the base annual salary. Mm -hmm. um, so it does need to be signed and it needs to be signed from someone in the company that has signatory authority, usually from human resources or uh, someone in a management position maybe. Um, but the difference when it comes to salary statements as far as uh, date is that salary statements we will only accept if they are less than six months old rather than one year. Mm -hmm. Two other things I'll mention about them because mm -hmm. I actually reviewed some salary statements yesterday mm -hmm. and uh, we we do need this to be a statement okay from from the bank or from your employer so this is a, a letter that meets all this criteria we don't accept the an income report like a something that you might file with your taxes or another legal document that's not what we're looking for we're looking for just a statement of your salary again on letterhead and signed and um, the the third of the salary is is really important here. So imagine someone's making ninety thousand dollars in a year. We're going to treat that like thirty thousand dollars toward your financial expenses. So you can add and um, combine all kinds of different types of documentation. So you could, we could use that thirty thousand from the salary, and then adding another thirty thousand from a bank account. You know, it can be from a number of sources. But just do the math on that, and to know how much your salary is actually going to contribute toward the I twenty. Mm -hmm. So along with money that you're getting from home or a sponsor, you can also perhaps have a UT Dallas scholarship. To learn about that um, through the admission process, ask those questions, talk to your department. That does not come from our office. We don't have anything to do with the actual getting of the scholarship. Mm -hmm. But once you have been offered the scholarship, we need to see it with meeting these requirements. Very similar to what we've already talked about. It needs to be on letterhead. It needs to include your full name. And it needs to describe the semester that it starts. This one is something to really take a look at because if it's just a general uh, scholarship that doesn't specifically state when it begins, we actually can't take that. So ask the department to revise it or use our financial, um, our scholarship affidavit, mm -hmm. which is what's shown um, on the screen there. It also needs to be signed by a department representative and email notifications of these award letters are not accepted. So we do need to see the official award. Right. And just as an example of what we mean when we say it must describe the semester that it takes effect, uh, an example that has come up recently is that uh, a student had a, le a letter with a UTD scholarship and the way that this, the letter described the scholarship was that it would be from spring through fall of that year. The issue was that because it only specifically mentioned the spring and the fall semesters in the letter, we could only calculate it for spring and fall. Mm -hmm. However, the department and the student were saying, no, 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 summer is included. Mm -hmm. But since summer was not specifically mentioned, yeah. we could not calculate it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, so instead, we we uh, provided them with the assistance ship affidavit that you can see on this slide uh, that allowed them to detail that all three semesters were included in those numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So the thing to remember is that we don't have any special information about your scholarship or your bank account or anything like that. So it all has to be written mm -hmm. for us easily to see on the scholarship or the documentation itself. We can't read between the lines or you know make anything up. It all has to be clearly written on mm -hmm. there. So in addition to the financial documents, which we've covered in detail, um, the last thing you need to get your I-20 is your passport. This passport obviously is issued by your home country. It's something you probably already have if you're interested in studying abroad here in the US. What we mean by your passport, though, is not every single page of your passport. <laughs> Believe it or not, I've gotten those emails sometimes. 
Um, what we just need is called the biographical page, which is this page that kind of looks like this. Um, it has your picture, your name, date of birth, and a future expiration date. We do check those expiration dates, so if you got a passport when you were young, and uh, it's expiring soon, go ahead and renew that before you ask for your I-20. The passport and your I-20 do need to match. Mm -hmm. So we're going to use the information actually from this machine readable zone, those little um, numbers and characters at the bottom of the screen, that's what we use to determine how to issue your I-20. So this is, again, a reason why it's important and make sure that we can see the whole passport page and that you don't cut it off and, and miss the bottom part down there because that's something that we use to make sure that we're interpreting your name correctly. And something that might be of note to some of you if you have a, a name where you do not have a separate uh, surname or family name and a first name or uh, how, how else would given you say name. given name mm -hmm. um, of some kind, there might be a slight mismatch in how the data shows on your passport, on your visa, and on your I-20, just because there are some limitations with the computer systems behind them. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, CVIS in particular cannot accept an entry without a surname. So if you only have a given name, that will show up in the surname field of your I-20. Mm -hmm. uh, just know that this is not a mistake. This is normal, and that's just how it has to be displayed. Right. Unfortunately, you know, well, the good news, good thing is names are very cultural, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I love my name. It means a lot of things, right? And your name is very special, and we don't want to... Uh, to change it at all, but it's unfortunately, um, because it, it, it's very cultural, our systems have to kind of meet some certain standards and names don't always fit perfectly within those standards. So if you feel like you might have a name issue and you know, if the names are just like Lark said, if they're not gonna fit within the, the terms that the US has restricted the systems to present, then you might have an issue with your visa not matching, with your I-94, Social Security, kind of, there's just a lot of different implications from that. If you think you might be in one of those situations, you can chat with us and we can talk about some options. Not to, not that you need to change your name, but it might be worth talking to your um, the people that are issuing your passport to see if something could be adjusted on that to better represent what your name would look like in the U.S. Does that make sense? Yes, I, I think so. so. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, those are the documents needed for your I-20. Hopefully you have all those in hand and can upload them to iComet right now, and we can issue your I-20 in about three business days. If you have other questions, we are here for you. You can send us a chat in our message there or send us an email to ilperspective at utdallas.edu. We're also available for phone appointments. So schedule a phone appointment. We'd love to answer any questions that you have. Um, our times that we're available are Central Standard Time, so mm -hmm. check that out and make that appointment, and we would love to give you a call and help you with any of those questions um, at that appointment. Yes, but you might have to do some calculations with your time zone yeah, to make keep, sure that you make that your appointment. <laughs> keep that in mind. Yes. All right. Well, we look forward to meeting you um, mm -hmm. in an upcoming semester and hopefully helping you along the way to get your I-20. All right. Uh, goodbye, everybody, and we'll hopefully see you soon. Mm -hmm.